What's up guys, Jay's Two Cents here and it's the holidays, which means a ton of you are building new computers or building your first computer, building a computer for someone else or upgrading an existing rig. And instead of just buying parts on Black Friday or Cyber Monday and going, here's what I got and the deals that are, by the time you guys see the videos, they've already passed by, you can't take advantage of them when they're out of stock. I'm gonna show you guys how I approach building a system with budgets and I'm going to hopefully arm you guys with information on how to spend your money more wisely that will apply to any time of the year. The holidays have arrived at MassDrop, the community-driven commerce site dedicated to finding the best products in over 15 user-driven communities. MassDrop is a great place to get high-quality products at amazing prices, and this year for the holidays, they're making it even easier to find that perfect gift. This year, MassDrop is introducing new flash sales that will be live on the site for a limited time of 12 hours or until the item sells out. Sign up is free, and these deals won't last. Get the perfect gift for your loved one or even yourself this holiday season by heading to MassDrop by clicking the link in the description below. So what you see right here are just different categories represented by parts that are required to build a system. If you're gonna be upgrading your system, then obviously only the parts that are in that category are going to matter to you. But you're gonna need a CPU, right? You've gotta have processor. You gotta have your memory, your storage, cooling, power delivery, a motherboard to plug it all into, and of course, your graphics card. Now the approach we're gonna to take today is that we are building a gaming system because gaming systems also make great workstations because typically they're a lot more powerful than you would find on like a typical web browsing machine, obviously. Now, it doesn't matter if you're talking about 500 bucks or 5,000 bucks, the word budget simply means that there is a cap that cannot be exceeded. Often, way too often, the word budget is confused with the word cheap. Now, although they are interchangeable and the word budget typically can refer to something as being less expensive or lesser of the amount of money available, the word budget in my particular vocabulary means it's a capped amount that we can't spend. So it could be $500 or $500,000, it's still a budget. So that's the way we're approaching the word today. Don't confuse it with the word cheap. Graphics cards are single-handedly the most expensive part you typically will put in your system. You could spend $100 on a graphics card or you could spend $1,200 on a graphics card for just one. Then of course, if you're going SLI, it just scales up from there. Although it doesn't scale great in SLI, you get the point. Now I tend to spend right around 25% if it's a low end uh, budget, like a $500 build, I'd put about 25% of that into the graphics card. Otherwise I'll go as high as 50% because this is the single most important part when it comes to gaming, when it comes to determining your gaming performance. Now the type of graphics card you're gonna buy has to do with a couple of different factors. One, what games are you playing? Do you need high FPS like CSGO players, right? The more FPS, the better for those guys. If you are, doing role-playing games and stuff, they tend to not require as much high FPS, like 60 FPS will get the job done. But also, what resolution are you playing at? If you're playing at 1080p, you don't need super high-end graphics cards anymore because 1080p is getting really easy for modern graphics cards to push. The amount of advancement we've made with GPUs, with the amount of time 1080's been the norm, is uh, very good, actually. And in fact, if you look at the Steam um, survey, you can see that most players like nine out of 10 are still on a 1080p or lesser panel. But if you wanna go with 4K or 1440p, then obviously the more graphics power you can get, the better in my opinion, there's no cap. I'd go with two of the most powerful graphics cards you could possibly buy if you're going for 4K or a nice mid-range to high-end if you're going 1440. But you know what can affect the performance of your graphics card? Your CPU. Because if you go with a real high-end graphics card and you go with a real low-end CPU, you're gonna get what's called bottlenecking, a term that's thrown around a lot and often misunderstood, but you can indeed impact the performance of your GPU if your CPU can't handle the task of your GPU. If the GPU is sending tons of frame rates to the, to the computer and the CPU can't actually handle that, then you get what's called bottlenecking where the GPU will slow down, and you get stutters and fluctuations in uh, FPS, which is not a good gaming experience. So if you're gonna go with a high-end GPU, especially if you're going, to go, going for high frame rate 1080p gaming, like 1440, uh, or 144 hertz or higher, 200 hertz even, then you're gonna to want to get a nice powerful CPU. Now overclocking can obviously help. So if you're going with like an i3, right? This is actually a two core hyper-threading CPU. I wouldn't personally pair an i3 with something like a 1070 Ti. I would probably pair it with something more like a 1050 Ti because we're not gonna be exceeding the CPU's capability with the GPU, and the GPU for 
1080p gaming is still more than enough to get the job done if you're after that mythical magical 60 FPS number. But if you're going for higher FPS, then you would definitely want to go with a higher end GPU and something like maybe a Ryzen 7 or like a 6700K or 7700K from Intel. Talking about CPUs now, that's the other controversy or the hard part, right? Intel or AMD. Well, the nice part of AMD, all AMD uh, CPUs are pretty much unlocked. All the Zen core architecture, whether it be Ryzen, whether it be Threadripper, they are overclockable. So overclocking is basically like free performance if you already have the cooling necessary. If you have to beef up your cooling to get the overclocking, then it's not necessarily free. You have to spend money on that. So that's the way I approach budgeting as well. But it's really an interesting time because 2017 was when AMD really made a splash in the CPU market. They actually changed the landscape a little bit and took some uh, market share away from Intel, which made Intel respond by launching X299 early and pulling Coffee Lake all the way into summer of 2017. Now, speaking of overclocking, you obviously are gonna have to have motherboards that can take advantage of that. So you're not gonna take something like uh, an, an Intel 6700K or a 7700K or even an 8700K and stick it on like an H270 or whatever the 370 version of this is because the H basically means that it's not overclocking. It still has a lot of features on there, right? It still has uh, all of your fan headers. It still has two PCI Express slots. You can run SLI or Crossfire, but it's really a stripped down motherboard. It takes away a lot of the features you don't care about. It's just bare bones designed to put a CPU in there and get up and running. And for most gamers, that's gonna be good enough. But if you're an enthusiast and you wanna overclock, then you definitely are gonna to wanna to get, you know, like an X370 or even a uh, B350 for, for AMD, which will allow for some overclocking and stuff. Uh, and same thing on Intel, right? You're not gonna take that i3 down there and stick it in a Maximus motherboard because that is just a gross negligence, an imbalance of money being spent. So you're just putting money in a motherboard that you're getting no performance benefit out of it. So if you're not overclocking, doesn't matter if you go with a high end motherboard and a low end motherboard, you're not gonna notice the difference. The difference is build quality, right? How good is the VRM engineered? How good's the cooling? How good is the, you know, the metal used in the socket and all that stuff. So you do get what you pay for with a motherboard. It's definitely easy to have diminishing returns. So pair an overclocking CPU with an overclocking motherboard and uh, vice versa. I mean, you just don't want to mix and match all of that, right? So you wouldn't put an i3 on this Maximus with a 1050 Ti. Do that, put it on Reddit, watch what happens. But the thing I absolutely hate shopping for, especially in 2017 with what's happened to prices, is RAM. Because both of these Intel and AMD CPUs that have come out, uh, well, Ryzen 2017, and anything 2016 or newer with Intel, pretty much requires DDR4. It's like, it's like precious metals in the stock market. It's always fluctuating. And unfortunately, we've been on an upward trend for quite a while. I like to recommend 16 gigabytes of memory for gaming PCs. Um, in fact, I even asked that on Twitter and you guys all agreed. Well, most of you agreed, 16 gigabytes or go home. Eight gigs is just not enough anymore these days, especially with modern titles. Some modern titles are even recommending 16 gigs with eight gigs being the minimum requirement. So you don't wanna create a future-proof problem for yourself if you scrimp now. Now you could get eight now and add more later, but uh, yeah, it's just unfortunate when you can spend a hundred bucks on eight gigs of memory. Back in the day, you could spend 100 bucks and get 16 gigs, or you could spend 45, 50 bucks and get eight gigs, no problem whatsoever. But that kind of died with DDR3, and uh, DDR4 is unfortunately an upward trend. We're hoping for a crash where it comes back down, but who knows. Now storage, this is another area where I get a lot of questions on Twitter. What kind of storage do I need for my gaming rig? You don't technically need anything more than spinning mechanical drive. The problem with these, they have slow boot times, they're very slow seek times, and load times in your games and booting for your system is gonna be painfully slow if you've ever experienced an SSD. But there's a lot of people that are okay with that and you wanna save money. So you could get a two terabyte uh, hard drive, 7200 RPM, 64 meg uh, cache hard drive, and you could get that for about 50, 60 bucks, no problem. And that saves money for everywhere else. The problem is this becomes, in my opinion, the bottleneck of the overall experience of your PC. You could spend a lot and go with M.2. The problem with M.2 is a lot like memory, it's very volatile. Uh, it's same thing with SATA drives, we'll talk about that in a second, but M.2 you're getting less per dollar, uh, less gigabytes per dollar with M.2. That's because this, this 
goes on the motherboard directly. It can go to PCI Express slot. It's not limited by the bandwidth of SATA. It's very, very fast. And because of it, it's also very sought after. Now prices have come down significantly since it first came out, but you could still spend five, 600 bucks on a SATA M.2 drive, no problem. That's why I recommend SATA. I mean, every gaming system I build is gonna have a SATA SSD. You guys have even complained in some of my budget builds that I'm putting SSDs in there when it's not necessary, but I'm sorry. I don't wanna wait two minutes for my system to build. I, I could see a brand new built system, fresh install of Windows take over two minutes to boot. It's just painful. So I will always recommend SATA drives, uh, even if you have to scrimp a little bit elsewhere in your system because they're fast, they get the job done, the amount of gigabytes per dollar that you can get with, get with these now is very, very good. In fact, this 500 gig uh, 850 Evo, I actually bought two of these. Um, they're actually for the camera that you're watching this on, but technically they, uh, I got this for $149 a drive. The sales are always happening. I got it on, on Amazon. So I think the performance per dollar of SATA is definitely where it's at right now. Now, another place that's really easy to overspend and get diminishing return is your power supply. The only time I would recommend going with a beefy, high, you know, 80 plus rating power supply is if you were overclocking high-end hardware. New, like AMD CPUs, uh, the X299 stuff from Intel, Nvidia graphics cards, especially AMD graphics cards that are overclocking friendly that you can push really far, like the new Pascal stuff, can exponentially draw power. So you could take a graphics card like the 1070 Ti that's like 180 watts or whatever it is, 190 watts, and push it to like 350 watts. I mean, I'm just throwing numbers out there, but like 1080s, you could push almost as high as 400 watts, 1080 Ti's, no problem can hit 400 watts if you're overclocking. So you definitely are gonna want to get a power supply that's gonna be friendly for that. So you don't want to have a power supply that's barely on the limit of being able to handle your hardware and then try overclocking, you'll get random blue screens and crashes and restarts and shutdowns, which could be your power supply. Now, if you go to PC Part Picker, they actually have a really good power meter calculator. So you can put in your parts, say if you're gonna be overclocking or not, and it will give you a very good recommendation of how much your power is gonna be drawing and what size power supply to go with. So I think that's a really good place to go to figure out what size power supply. But the ratings on here, the higher the metal uh, preciousness, precious, my precious, whatever. Uh, that was really cringy, huh? It's still great talking. The higher the metal, the more efficient it's gonna be, which means it takes less power from the wall to deliver the rated power of the power supply. I would rather save a little money and go with like a 750 watt bronze than paying for like a 750 watt platinum because then it saves more money elsewhere. And uh, the difference in power being drawn from the wall is actually not that much. In fact, I did a video about power draw and how much it actually costs you to run your computer. It's worth checking out. Um, now, obviously that brings us to cooling because depending on the type of cooling we need depends on whether or not we're overclocking or not and what kind of CPU we have. If we're going with like a low wattage i3 CPU, you could save some money and probably go with the box cooler if you're not planning on overclocking. It'll be more than enough to get the job done. But I like to err on the side of insurance by overcooling stuff is obviously with all the water cooling and stuff, I like to overcool my parts. But if I'm gonna be overclocking, the box cooler, not gonna get it done. So you need to go with some sort of, a, of an air cooler at the very minimum. Now I don't have it on display right here, but one of the most epic air coolers that has ever lived is the Cooler Master Hyper 212. If you guys look at any review of it, thousands and thousands of reviews on Newegg and Amazon and all of that, probably one of the best bang for buck coolers that you can possibly buy. I mean, it just doesn't really get any better than the price of performance on that. It's about 25 to 30 bucks depending but you can scale up from there, right? You can go all the way up to giant Noctua coolers. You got big push-pull air coolers like right here. You can push-pull on the Evo. Um, highly recommended air cooler. If you want better than stock cooling, I recommend it. That's not sponsored or anything. That's just my opinion. But uh, you could also step it up even farther by going with a AIO water cooler like the Celsius right here on the bottom because it's gonna give you the cooling efficiency of water on a smaller scale of, than a custom loop. The only problem with putting water in your system is if you've never done it before, it's probably gonna be a little bit scary because everyone's afraid of leaks. It's a risk, it could happen. Uh, personally, it's only happened to me twice in like the last 15 years of water cooling, but um, it's, a, it's just a, it's an enthusiast thing. I like to do it, I'm gonna continue to do it. If you wanna step up from an AIO, you could go with a full custom loop in a box like we have right here with the Fluid Gaming Series from EK. Comes with all the parts you need, all the fittings, even the jumper to jump your power supply to bleed the system. So depending on how far you wanna overclock or how far, or how many cores and all of that, it's gonna depend on the type of cooling you'll go with. But I highly recommend air if you want 
maintenance-free operation, just blow out some dust every now and then. Uh, I, that might surprise some people hearing me say I recommend air, but that's a situation that makes a lot of sense. And then of course, water cooling. Now, what you don't see on the table here, obviously, is cases. That's because I tend to see what I have left over after I've chosen the parts that actually affect performance, because cases only do two things. They're a box to put your parts in, and then they create a cooling environment. Because when you have a case and you have intake fans and exhaust fans, you're promoting directional airflow, which is gonna blow air over the RAM and the motherboard and the back plate of the graphics card, which helps take heat out of your system. Now that's how you're gonna determine what kind of case you need. If you're air cooling, decent amount of airflow will get the job done. If you're water cooling, you wanna make sure that you can fit your radiator, of course. If you buy a 360 rad and you get a case that only supports 240 rads, that's obviously a problem. You also wanna make sure that if you're going with a very tall air cooler, that your case is large enough to actually fit the air cooler with, and still close the side panel. Um, something else I forgot to mention with coolers though too is you also wanna make sure that if you go with a big cooler and you have tall RAM, this actually isn't tall RAM right here. This is tall RAM. If you go with tall RAM, then you wanna make sure it's gonna clear underneath your air cooler. Most modern air coolers now are better about offsetting in such a way that they'll fit. Definitely something worth keeping in mind though. So it really comes down to aesthetics and personal taste and size constraints. Cause if you have a limited space it can go in, you're not gonna go with like a giant like EVGA case like what's behind me right here. And if you've got a, a big space that you wanna fill in with a big case, cause you're like big cases mean I've got a big gaming addiction, then uh, you're not gonna wanna put a tiny little ITX case in there. So you also have to look at it. If it's ugly and you don't like the case, sure you can switch it later, but um, try and get something that at least appeals to your taste. The confusing part about building a new system, especially for first timers, is which cooler do I go with and which power supply and which this and which that, and then all the way down to, okay, I picked, I want a 1070 Ti. Do I get an EVGA? Do I get an Asus, an MSI? Do I get a Gla Galax? What do I do? For the most part, guys, it's all gonna perform pretty much the same. All 1070 Ti's perform roughly the same, all 1080's. So go with the one you think looks best and has good reviews for, for cooling and stuff like that. But if you think I missed something, Put it down in the comments below. There's a wealth of information behind my behind me with my followers. There's a lot of people down there that are always willing to help. And uh, I'm, I'm proud of my viewers for offering up the help. So keep it civil, guys. Have some good conversation down there. Let me know if you think I missed anything. I'm gonna go. Thanks for watching. And as always, I'll see you in the next one.